All right, so um, basically when you first start your car, the spark plugs need energy, so the reaction goes forward. And then when you're driving, the wheels spinning spins your alternator and recharges this. So we can even think about it as energy being on the reactant side. And so when we need energy, the reaction goes forward. And when we have extra energy from the wheels turning, the reaction goes backward. And so this is a reversible battery, which is very, very useful. It's rechargeable. You can buy double A's that are rechargeable as well. Um, the downside to rechargeable batteries is that eventually something runs out. Sometimes it's the sulfuric acid that runs out, and sometimes it's the water. The lead is always going to be there, but um, there can only be so many discharge and recharge cycles. Um, so every battery needs to be replaced eventually. Another rechargeable battery is the lithium ion battery that you might have in your computer or your phone. Those are very small and very efficient, very high energy batteries. Um, and they're getting better and better every year. They're designing new um, battery technology. So like if you buy a phone now, it'll, it'll hold a charge for one or two days, depending on how much internet usage you have. Um, Ten years ago, you were lucky if your phone without internet kept a charge for like five or six hours. So um, we are making scientific improvements on these things, but the basic premise is that uh, lithium ion batteries are in the front ways is producing electrons. So that's what, you know, like when you're using your device, that's what it's doing, it's going forward. Um, and so you have this complicated solid mixture of lithium and cobalt and oxygen. And we use an X for the subscript there because it can vary. It can vary anywhere from five lithiums to, you know, 10 or 20, depending on the battery manufacturer. And so, but what happens in the forward reaction is one of the lithiums leaves, so it's X minus one, to produce lithium ion and an electron. So here in this case, um, Cobalt is oxidized, so it goes from cobalt 3 plus over here to cobalt 4 plus over here. And um, in the reverse direction, when I need to charge the battery, what I do is I, is I add electrons from the wall, you know, from the electricity company. So we add electrons, and what that's going to do is push the reaction backwards to reform the stuff that we started with. However, if, if I have reformed all of my initial lithium ion complex and I keep charging it, something bad happens. We call this overcharging. Um, and so what happens is if I keep putting electrons in after I have um, reduced all of the cobalt back to a uh, three plus, what it does, it forms this other substance, cobalt oxide and lithium oxide. And once that happens, because those compounds are not involved in this reaction, it is not reversible anymore. So if you leave your cell phone plugged in longer than it needs to be for charging purposes, what happens is you make this cobalt oxide and lithium oxide. And so that means you have less of your lithium ion available. Um, so that means that your battery lasts a shorter period of time. This is why you have to buy a new phone after like, you know, a year or two. So you can avoid that by simply not charging your phone for as long. Okay. All right. So a little summary of, of how redox reactions apply to our daily lives. Um, if we have a dead car battery and we don't have a jump start available, one of the quickest ways to try and fix the problem is to bring the battery up to a warmer temperature. Now, I'm not saying that you should heat it up on the stove or anything. That would that would be crazy. Please don't do that. But what I am saying is that if it's, you know, 20 degrees outside and your battery's not working, disconnect it safely from your car and bring it inside for a while, and it will recharge. All right. Um, so you can also have, there's portable jump, starters, which is basically just a battery that you can plug into your car battery and it'll jump it to give you a little bit of energy. Uh, I told you the story in lab about what I did when I was a kid with my mom's lamp. 
when the power goes out and you don't have a flashlight, it's okay because you probably have salt in your in your um, you know available to you. And we know that salt is an electrolyte. So if you have a battery or anything, you can plug a lamp into a battery and run it off of a salt battery. Uh, the same thing, by the way, works really well with like um, different kinds of vegetables. You can use tomatoes and lemons and even potatoes to, all you do is plug the light in and it will light up because those chemicals also have ions in them. Um, understanding how our, our device batteries work saves us a ton of money. Like if you leave your laptop plugged in all the time, the battery life is going to dramatically decrease. So instead, what you should do is unplug it to use it, use it until the battery is totally dead, and then plug it in just as long as you need to to charge the battery. I guarantee if you do that, the life of your phone or your laptop or whatever will be extended exponentially. Also, it's very bad to be using your device while it's charging. Discharging and recharging at the same time um, burns the battery out just very, very quickly. And you know that because whenever you do that, your phone gets super hot. That's not a good sign. We don't want our devices to be hot because they don't work very well when they're hot. Another great tip using redox reactions is to avoid polishing silverware. I'm the eldest grandchild in my family, so what this means is that every holiday when I was a kid that we went to my grandmother's house, I was the one who had to polish her 200 and something piece silverware set. And I can tell you the chemical that, that she gave me to do that with was disgusting. It was, you know, it would chap your skin and it smelled awful. Um, so instead, here's a, here's a life hack from chemistry. All you've got to do is take a, a, a container, like a plastic container, put some aluminum foil in the bottom, sprinkle a little bit of salt and a little splash of vinegar and put the silverware on into this mixture with some water and leave it there for a few minutes. And pretty soon, when you come back, all that tarnish is going to be gone. All that sort of gross silver coating is gone. This works for silver jewelry or for silverware or whatever. Uh, it doesn't destroy anything. It actually makes, it keeps the solid silver in place because it's a redox process that makes the ion silver go back to solid silver. Um, and it's really cheap and easy to do. When you do, uh, when you polish silverware, what you're actually doing is just scrubbing off the oxidized silver. So eventually you sort of lose detail in your, in your necklace or whatever. So this is a way better way. Trust me. Also, if you don't like squashy apples slices for lunch, then you can prevent that from happening. So apples oxidize, that means they turn brown, because there's an enzyme in them called polyphenol oxidase, which is just a fancy way of saying that if it's exposed to air, it turns brown and a little bit mushy. In order to prevent that, you can add some acid because the acid prevents the oxidation from occurring. Um, and so your apples stay relatively, relatively fresh. Also in biology, our, our entire body systems are based on redox reactions, particularly of iron. Iron is responsible for moving electrons around our bodies. So without redox reactions, we, we would not exist at least the way that we are. And so it's important to understand a little bit about how they work. All right, that's it for this chapter.